Hey, how is everybody doing? I'm going to turn down the volume a little bit on my mic here. Hope everybody's doing really, really well. It's Thursday, so it is, in a sense, the end of our week. Where the heck did the week go here in Hardcore Bible Commentary? Pastor Rick Thornhill, we are in the Old Testament book of Malachi. Um, Malachi is probably a book that, you know, you didn't just pick up. You know, I really never hear somebody walk up to me and say, hey, you know, I just really have this strong desire to read the book of Malachi. But that's why I thought it would be a good uh, a good place to start here and a, and a good thing to study because it's not uh, the book, the, the average book that people are uh, looking at. So um, hopefully you guys are getting something out of this. Um, even though the overtones on it can make it a pretty pretty stiff message, I guess, to hear. Um, but when you realize that, you know, this was the last prophetic voice to speak um, until Jesus would come, basically what's happening is the, the, the stage is being set. In other words, the, the, there's a tone being given and a stage is being set where God is pointing out his grievances to the people of Israel and their priestly system and the defects that he has in that and the reason why when the Messiah would come, the Messiah would straighten everything out uh, once and for all. So praise the Lord, we are under the new covenant um, covered by the blood of Jesus, born again, saints of God. And um, there's a, another message today. Um, the good news is, if you listened yesterday, we will not be talking about poop or spreading poop on anybody's face. That was uh, kind of one time for yesterday. Today, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about marriage and why marriage matters to God. And I think this is going to be um, very timely for us because uh, we live in a day and age where one of the big hot button topics is the topic of same-sex marriage and you know there's a reason why um, as believers in Christ that we oppose um, same-sex marriage and it's not because we hate anybody I mean we're not called to hate anybody we're called to love people and the reality of it is is that we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God but God does have a way that he has called us to live he has a way that um, and marriage isn't just a contract between two people. There's something much bigger um, in that. And so we kind of need to kind of go over that and cover that. And that's what we're going to do today. That's going to be our assignment um, as we pick up in the book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, Pam, good morning to you. Eric, coming from Neville Island, Neville Island Beach, PA. Again, man, you swim in that water, not sure what will happen to you. You may grow another arm or you may come out of that glowing. I'm sure that water is highly, highly polluted down there. Um, you know, if you don't know where Neville Island is, if you've ever been on Route 65 going to Pittsburgh, there used to be this place. And I mean, it had this big stack coming up and it was like a never ending flame, man. It was uh Calgon Carbon, I think, was the name of the factory, and it would have this never-ending flame. I mean, just major pollution um, pouring out in the air. I was, uh, I actually worked there uh, for a season when I was a uh, when I was a mailman, and uh, man, I, I I worked out there. There was a guy that you know got injured, um, and I I took his route for a little while, and they had this place where they made dog food. It was, uh, I want to say, was it was it Joy Dog Food? But I, I don't know, but it was a dog food rendering plant. And something happened where uh, the, whatever machine they had that sort of cleansed the, 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 the chemicals that were being released when they were making this dog food, it broke. But instead of just shutting down supplies, they just kept running it until the county had to come and actually shut them down. And I remember, man, it was like the middle of the summer. And I mean, the whole 
island just smelled like an outhouse, man. I mean, or no, not really an outhouse, more like a dumpster that was full to the top on a hot summer day. The entire place just totally stunk, man. I mean, it was just terrible working there, but I know they cleaned it up a little bit and uh, actually Neville Island's not a bad place. Mary, good morning. I don't know if you got Chops there watching with you. I hope so. Erica, good morning to you. Uh, Stephanie, uh, Nancy, and Steve. And uh, yeah, Steve said he grew up swimming. I swam in the Ohio River, but I never swam right in front of, um, right around Neville Island. I jumped in the river a couple times um, down in Baden, but I never... I never really uh, jumped in, and um, Pam is saying that someone is going to get poop in their face, but I don't know who they're talking about. We're trying to move beyond that. That was yesterday's topic. Today, we have a whole nother topic. We're going to elevate the conversation, so no poop talk today. Malachi chapter 2, verse 10, let's begin there. This is God speaking through the prophet. Okay, Eric will get some if he. Erica, Erica Joy used to swim in Neville Island, and you, you seem like you're all right. So maybe it's safer than 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 what we think. You seem like you're doing totally fine, good and healthy. You don't have like six toes or anything like that. So that's awesome. So maybe it is safe to swim in. I don't know, Eric. Go ahead and jump in if you get hot today. Let's go to Malachi chapter 2, verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another? By profaning the covenant of our fathers. So again, here's questions, rhetorical questions that... Um, that the prophet is asking, have we all not one father? Yes, God, right? Has not one God created us? Yes. Why do we deal treacherously with each other by profaning the covenant of our fathers? And then he's going to explain what that is. Verse 11, Judah has dealt treacherously with an abomination and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign God. May the Lord cut off the tents of Jacob, the man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. So, Okay, obviously what he's talking about when he talks about that you deal treacherously with one another, he's talking about the nation, right? And so, you know, the 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 nation of um, Israel had been divided. It, it was a divided nation. It was divided in two parts. You had Judah and you had Israel. And so when they talk about Judah and they talk about Israel, they're not talking about people. They're talking about a nation. And may the Lord cut off the tents of Jacob. Again, Jacob is um, another word for Israel. So they kind of, it's a little tricky, but they, they're, they're talking about, pe they're, they're using people's names, but they're talking about actual nations there. And so he's saying that, you know, we're supposed to be one. And number one, the nation is divided. So that's one problem because they were supposed to be one people under God. So number one, the nation is divided. But even in that, you know, they basically, what the practice was of that day is a lot of these men, you know, they would start off in marriage um, and, and they, when they were young and they would marry, um, a, you know, a Jewish woman. And they would marry them. And when the woman got older, in a sense, they would divorce the woman and they began taking, um, they, they would marry foreign wives who weren't believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These were 
women who married foreign gods. So it was very fleshly that basically they were getting rid of, you know, when, when they thought that their wife was older or whatever, or they, they another, what, what they thought was the next best thing came around, then they would marry um, a, a, another woman, uh, a younger woman, and they would marry a woman that, um, if that wasn't bad enough, they would marry a woman that was serving foreign gods. So they weren't even a believer. And so when he says you have profaned the covenant of our fathers, what they're referring to is from the book of Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse four or one through four. And let me read this. And this was God's intention here because I don't want people to have a misunderstanding because what I have heard sometimes is I've heard people basically say that like, basically like, uh, white people shouldn't marry black people or white people shouldn't marry Spanish people or, you know, uh, Chinese people shouldn't marry black people, whatever it is that basically that people should marry within their own race and that they'll use the Bible to say, well, the Bible says that you shouldn't mix with people from other races. And it's a, it's a very big misunderstanding. And with a little bit, I mean, just a tiny bit of reading and understanding, you would know why that is incredibly foolish and incredibly foolish statement and not what God intended at all. Um, it wasn't about, it was never about that you couldn't marry somebody from a different race because they had a different culture. They were um, a different skin color than you. What it was is that marriage was supposed to be reserved for people who were believers. That's why in the New Testament, it says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. That's why you're supposed to marry somebody who is, you know, it never ceases to amaze me how, you know, somebody, whether it's, it's a young woman or a young man, and they can be gumming the church, and all of a sudden they begin talking to me about th this new person who they're interested in, they're excited about, and my first question is, is are they a Christian? Because if they're not a Christian, then you really have no business talking to them because they're not going to under, they're not going to be on the same wavelength. And the mistake that people make is what I call missionary dating. Missionary dating does not work. What is missionary dating? Well, I date somebody who's not a Christian with the intentions that one day they'll become a Christian. And I'm not saying that it never happens, but I'm saying that it rarely happens. And what happens is people end up getting unequally yoked with an unbeliever, and then it ends up in a power struggle because, you know, they're trying to live a Christian life and the other person has no interest in living a Christian life. So they want to go to church. The other person doesn't want to go to church. The other person, why are you spending so much time at the church? Why you got to go to the church? Well, you already go to church on Sunday. Why you got to go to Bible study? The other person wants to raise their kid at church, wants to send them to Christian youth camps. You know, the other person doesn't care. Well, why don't we just let, why don't we let little Johnny make his own decisions? So these are the things you run into trouble when you marry an unbeliever. And so it was the same way in the old covenant that they were instructed not to marry people from other tribes because not because it was a racial thing, but because those tribes served foreign gods, pagan gods. And we're going to read about it. Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse one through four. It says, when the Lord, your God brings you into the land, which you go to possess, and he has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Peruzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them, nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter from your son. And this is the reason why. For they will turn your sons away from following me, to serve other gods, so the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. So he's saying you have profaned the covenant of your fathers, 
Marriage is a covenant, and we're going to get into kind of what that means, but marriage is a covenant, and they were instructed that when they went in and possessed the land and the people of, of that land were dispossessed, that they were not supposed to enter into, they were not supposed to allow their children to enter into marriages with these people because if they did, what would happen is the people that they married that serve foreign gods would entice the people who started off as believers, their sons and daughters, to quit worshiping God and actually follow after foreign gods. So he's saying that, you know, what these guys are doing is they're not only are they divorcing the wife of their youth, but they're turning around and they're marrying people that are that serve foreign gods that aren't believers. And at the same time, the same these same people that are doing this, that are kind of divorcing their wife and putting them off. And, and again, it would have been a, a really bad idea because a lot of times, you know, back in that culture, a lot of women didn't have the means to sustain themselves. So basically, you know, they would be kind of kicked to the curb and then these people would go and they would marry, you know, a, a younger wife from a foreign land that wasn't even serving God. Yet at the same time, this, th these men that were doing it would still come and offer up sacrifices at the temple. So they would still sort of practice this religion, but it was a hollow religion because they were disregarding their wives. They were disregarding the covenant of their fathers and the priests weren't putting a stop to it. And so that's one of the reasons why Malachi is addressing the priest so hard. And he's saying that, you know, your blessing is cut off at this point because you're dealing treacherously and then you're trying to still come and, and, and do an offering. I remember uh, that, you know, um, my wife's family is, uh, you know, old Italian, you know, from uh, Italy. And they said, you know, back in the day in the Catholic church, when you would attend Catholic church, that basically all the, the mafia guys, they would call them the black hands. Um, they would stand in the, in the back of the church. So all the, uh, all the, you know, the, the people would be sitting in church. You would have, you know, a lot of the women and children, a lot of the normal people, everything, they would be sitting in church. And then the mafia people would all be standing towards the back. So they would come to church and, you know, they would sort of have, you know, this uh, appearance that they were, you know, they'd be nicely dressed. They would be like family men. They would still come to church. They were still going through rituals. But at the same time, they were wicked because of the stuff they were doing with the mafia, whether that was, you know, extorting people, loan sharking, you know, um, running, you know, speakeasies and things like this you know, maybe even killing people, but they still had sort of this guise of religion. And so, you know, again, you know, you go back to the book of Revelations that we talked about early on, you know, I wish that you were hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. So I spit you out of my mouth. And it seems that one of the greatest offenses to God is a person that still goes through sort of these religious um, actions, but at the same time, their heart isn't in it and they're still very wicked. So these men are doing everything against the word of God, yet they're still coming forth to the temple and they're still acting very religious and holy and acting like everything is okay. And God's like, not everything's not okay. Verse 13, and this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But he did not make them one. But he, but did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? because he seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. 
Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. So he's saying that the reason that you don't want to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever in your marriage is because God's desire is that you would raise godly offspring. Again, go back to creation. Be fruitful and multiply and what? Subdue the earth. So the idea was that we are created in God's image and God's likeness. God has given us the ability to reproduce after our kind, male and female. Together, we come together in a covenant of marriage, one man, one woman for life. And the purpose is to produce godly offspring, that we would have families that would love and live and serve the Lord. They would have children who would serve God, and therefore you would populate the earth with godly people, and the kingdom of God would expand because there would be more godly people in the earth. And so if you're unequally yoked with an unbeliever, then basically, um, you know, number one, the covenant of the marriage isn't even the same because, you know, if God gave marriage, then if somebody doesn't even believe in God, then it's kind of like, what's the point? But the other thing, again, is that they will not encourage the children to, to live and serve God. And that is, you know, one of the parent, our parents' jobs is to train our children up in the training and the admonition of the Lord that we are required to teach our children about God, to teach them about God in our life, the things that God does, how to live and serve God. And that's the parent's job. And so marriage is a holy institution. It has been established by God. And that's one of the reasons why it's troubling to uh, people when they say, well, we want to make same-sex marriage legal. And if two people want to make a contract together, I mean, hey, I guess it's a free country. We can't stop them. But don't call it a marriage because marriage is something that has been given by God. And God is not going to bless a behavior that he considers sinful. And the Bible is clear. The Bible is totally clear from beginning to end that it's wrong for two men, two women to lay down with one another. It, it, it's wrong. Marriage has been was established in the Garden of Eden, and it was supposed to be a covenant between two people. And a covenant, we talked a lot about blood covenants in the book of Genesis, and that the covenant was an everlasting agreement. That's why when you put your wedding ring on, it's a sign and seal of the covenant and a circle doesn't have a beginning or an end. So there's no end. So it's supposed to be eternal, an eternal covenant in marriage. That's why it says that, you know, Jesus cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. Because the east is from the west, right? The way that the, the world is, it's right. The east from the west is a circle, right? There's a north pole and a south pole. There's not an east pole and a west pole. So there's a never ending. In other words, they're, they're cast, they're gone forever. It, it, it's an eternal thing. I want to read some of the study notes from um, the Spirit-Filled Life Bible here. It says, marriage is based on covenant. When two people marry, God stands as a witness to the marriage, sealing it with the strongest possible word, covenant. Covenant speaks of faithfulness and enduring commitment. Divorce is described as violence because it does violence to God's intention for marriage, to the mate to whom one has been joined, to the children of the union. Proverbs 2.17 even equates one who forsakes their spouse with one who forgets God's covenant. However, where husband and wife abide in the, the commitment of their marriage vows, all the power of the covenant keeping God stands behind them and their marriage. God highly prizes and supports the concept of covenant commitment because it is a picture of his love and faithfulness to us. To see the nature of how he would apply this concept, study God's first covenant as it records the desire for a relationship, the giving of a token and the seal of the covenant and the eternal commitment of the covenant. 
Covenant is given as the guarantee of God's unending fidelity, and he calls us to the same truth and spirit of love's deepest meaning. Now, when it talks about a covenant, it says, go back to the first time that the Bible actually used covenant. And the first time it, it, it actually uses the word covenant is with Noah. And Noah, he uses the word covenant. He says that he's going to destroy the world because of its wickedness. But with Noah, he wanted to make a covenant. So there was a desire for a relationship between God and Noah. And God made a covenant with Noah. And we know Noah built the ark. The world was flooded. And then after the waters receded, what was the sign and seal of the covenant? It was the rainbow in the sky, which ironically, the rainbow has been used to symbolize gay pride. So what they did is they took, it's like they, they took reality, they took God's word and they turned it on its head. And so now they shove the covenant that God made with Noah, where we get the covenant, where, where we get the same covenant language of marriage that is between one man and one woman. Why? To produce godly offspring. Two men or two women cannot produce godly offspring. That can only happen between a man and a woman who are submitted to God. And in marriage, we make a covenant with God. It's not just two people making an agreement with one another. It's two people making a covenant with one another and making a covenant with God. God made a covenant with Noah that he was going to build a people through Noah. He told Noah, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. And I'm going to set my rainbow in the sky as a sign and seal of an everlasting covenant with you. And it's the same way when we get married, one man, one woman under God, we give a covenant seal. We have a ceremony. The, the pastor that's doing it actually uses scripture and represents as a physical representation of God coming into the marriage to put those two people together. And then there's always a, a seal of the covenant that is generally a ring and a ring is put in the covenant in the same way that the rainbow was meant to be an everlasting covenant. And the world's taken that beautiful symbol of God's love for his people to replenish the earth in a godly way, and it's taken it and made it something that basically shakes its fist at God and says, you know, God, you made me like this, that, that basically that I'm not a sinner, that you messed up and you made me like this and therefore I am who I am and I'm going to love who I want to love. And they flipped the whole thing on its head. And even more than that, just in the same way that God was angry with the sacrifices when we talked about them bringing sacrifices that were, you know, the blind and the sick, you know, they would bring the blind and the sick sheep and goats and, you know, they would bring the stuff that they didn't want, their leftovers, that's what they were offering to God. And one of the, number one, it showed that their heart wasn't in it, um, that they were just kind of giving God their leftovers. But number two, it also destroyed what was supposed to be a type and shadow. And in that sacrificial system because it was something that prefigured and pointed to the Messiah that was going to come, right? The lamb was without spot or blemish. That represented the sinless, perfect life of Christ. Jesus was without sin, right? He was sinless in word, thought, and deed. So there was a type that was being preserved by God. In the same way, the reason that it says that the Lord God of Israel hates divorce there was a type of foreshadowing where, where marriage represents Christ and the church. And you can read about that in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, 22 through 23. But um, I'm not going to read it all, but it says that this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So marriage was given to us to represent Christ and the church. Why? Because Christ saw us in our sin, knew we were imperfect, 
yet he chose to love us anyway. When we give our life to him, Christ, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So we, by faith, we enter into this covenant. It was a blood covenant that was shed by Jesus' blood. And Jesus says, I know you're not perfect, but you know what? You're mine and I'm going to love you anyway. When I walk down the aisle with somebody, I know they're imperfect. You know, my, my wife is not perfect. But I've made the choice that I'm going to love her anyway. Until death do us part. And so when somebody is just kind of, and, and listen, I want to, I want to emphasize here that, you know, if you, you know, if you're somebody who got a divorce, uh, for whatever reason, you know, the, the grace of God is, is there for you. The grace of God really is. And there are biblical grounds for divorce. Obviously, if somebody's being abused, uh, if, if there's infidelity, um, if there's abandonment, you know, there, there are biblical reasons for somebody to get divorced, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about men who simply just get sick of their wives and just get divorced, right? Or women do this too. They just get sick of it and they, 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 they just decide to get married to somebody else. And when they do that, what are they saying about the imaging of Christ and the church? If marriage is given as this image and this type of shadow of what Christ and a church is supposed to be, it's saying that Jesus gives up on us, but he doesn't give up on us. That's an imperfect description. So in the sense, when you get divorced in that manner, it defanes the whole meaning of marriage and it profanes God himself because it represents Christ and the church and marriage in its purest form is a beautiful thing. And Erica says that he's there and he will restore back the years of the canker worm, the years that you've been stolen. If you were in a bad, abusive relationship, God can restore that. But you got to do it God's way. And marriage does take, you know, uh, grace and patience. And God will grow you in grace, patience, love, long-suffering, all those within your marriage but when we just kind of just treat marriage as as it's nothing uh that's that's disrespectful to the lord and he calls it treacherous and it was a treacherous going on and god wanted to make meaning of it he wanted to he wanted to let them know that hey this is not okay with me. So again, just add it to the list of the grievances of God through the prophet and the reason why Jesus had to come back and set these things straight. Hey, so that's it for today, uh, getting into the subject of marriage. We're going to pick up in Malachi chapter three. We have one more verse to pick up in chapter two, but that's going to better kind of go along with Malachi chapter three. Um, I am, uh, we obviously, you know, if, if you can, we'd love to see you at our Sunday service, our Sunday gathering here at New Hope Community Church. If you're local in our Western PA area, if you're not local, you know, jump on a plane, come see us for a weekend. Love to see you, love to meet you. Um, also, we have Bible study tonight. If you would like to come, we'll be unpacking. Uh, Brother Dan's message on the baptism of the Holy Spirit from last Sunday. So if you want to come tonight, we'd be happy to have you. We grow spiritually while building relationships. Again, that's here at the church in our education building um, in the green room. So, hey, God bless you. I love you all. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for godly spouses. Lord, I thank you for restoration. And Lord, most of all, I thank you that even in our times of failing, that you don't give up on us. So we thank you for your grace and mercy. We give you honor and glory. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, God bless each and every one of you. Love you. I'm out of here.
Hey, if God puts it on your heart, if you've been blessed by this program, by the studies that are here, we would love for you to give and support the work of this ministry. I'll thank you in advance, and I'll believe according to God's word that he'll bless you. Text the word GIVE, 724-384-7551, fornewhope.org. You click that Donate tab. You can give a one-time gift, or you can become a partner. Decide that I'm just going to give a little bit every month. It makes it easy for you. The money just comes out. Seed goes into the ground, so you're sure that you'll always receive a harvest. Venmo app is at New Hope Ambridge. You can give that way. Cash app, Rick, T-H-R-O. And, of course, by mail, New Hope Ambridge, 592 Beaver Road, Ambridge, PA, 15000.